Hey there, I'm James. Welcome to Game Stories, where we write games that tell stories. And in this episode, we are talking about how board games tell stories. Now, when you think about board games, your mind might immediately go to something like Monopoly uh, or Risk or something, and your first thought might be, you know, board games don't really tell that good of stories. Or if you have memories or stories about board games, it might be something like, oh, I remember that one time we played Monopoly with so-and-so and he got all mad because he lost, right? You might have player stories about the board games you're familiar with, but maybe not stories that came out of the games themselves. Well, in the last 30 years or so, there's been quite a lot of um, design progression within the board gaming space. Modern board game designs are really different and really far advanced from games like Monopoly and Risk. Um, although we'll take a look in this episode or the next at a variant of Risk um, that's pretty impressive. Uh, and a lot of these developments have um, not only been more mechanically complex and interesting, they've also been narratively more complex and interesting. So we'll take a look at kind of how that happens over this video. Um, maybe the next, we'll see if this turns into two or not. Okay, so let's get started. I've got uh, my notes here. Board games tell stories these days. Let's see how they do it. The first thing is to know about is theme. We're talking, when we're talking about theme in board games, we are talking about this. You may, if you watched my last video, um, you'll remember this, uh, How RPG Rules Work by um, Vincent Baker. He said that in role-playing games, and I am saying in, in any kind of games, there's sort of what people do, there's the rules and systems and physical components and stuff, and then there's this imaginary world that gets generated. Um, and how those different pieces are used um, determines what kind of a game it is largely, right? Um, so theme is kind of what's out here, what's in this imaginary world, okay? In a game like this, this is a picture of Yinch, Y-I-N-S-H. Um, this is an abstract strategy game. It is a game that has no poofy cloud of imagination whatsoever. It just has people doing things and the rules and stuff that they do them to. Um, in this game, you are moving rings around in this weird hex grid, and you are placing these uh, tiles on the board, circular tiles on the board. You're jumping over them to flip their colors, and your job is to get five in a row of your color three times, and then you win. Uh, games like Chess and Go are also abstract strategy games. However, even those games have like a tiny little bit of that imaginary cloud space, that little bit of theme in that they, they're war games. Go is about encircling your opponent's troops and chess is about you know positioning your troops on a battlefield so they have the best position. Um, although when you play those games, you're not really imagining yourself immersed in some kind of war battle. Uh, generally, you're more concerned with the physical pieces on the board and their relationship to each other and finding tactical and strategic advantages. That's what's happening with Yinch. And it doesn't even pretend to be a war game. It's just rings and dots and weird lines and moving around, right? Kind of the next level up from abstract strategy is board games with a really light theme or a theme that sometimes board gamers say is pasted on, meaning there's a core set of mechanisms and then on top of that the designer laid a kind of a theme that doesn't really match with the mechanisms or doesn't need the, the, the mechanisms don't need the theme in order to work but the theme is kind of nice right uh, a game like that and there's many is bonanza by Uwe rosenberg um, this is a card game where you are collecting sets of cards and playing sets of cards and then exchanging large sets of cards for money or points in the game. Uh, and you do that primarily by drawing cards from the deck and then trading those with other players. You can trade out of your hand and you can trade from the cards that you're given each turn. Uh, and you do that and negotiate and bargain and haggle until you get the best deal and basically the best wheeler dealer is the person that's going to win. Um, with some randomness thrown in by the card deck, right? Um, so this is a game that could have been about trading anything. You don't have, you don't have to be bean farmers for this game to work. You just need uh, the numbers on the cards to tell you what value they are and how many of them you need to get how many points. Um, that's what really matters here. And the fact that they're sort of cute, weird bean pictures uh, helps because it makes it sort of appealing and friendly and light. 
Um, but it, it could have been some other commodity or some other kind of trading thing that was happening. It would have worked just fine, right? The real game is not the bean story. And the bean story really doesn't generate much in the way of this cloud. Um, it just sort of is there in the background to think about if you want to, right? Makes a nice coat of paint for the, for the game. Uh, and then there are games where the theme is kind of like deep and immersive and the mechanics are meant to bring you deeper into that experience, right? And a game like that might be um, Freedom, the Underground Railroad. This is a picture of that board. This is a game that recreates the Underground Railroad, which was meant to, which was this sort of social network that freed slaves from the south and moved them up north into Canada where uh, hopefully they wouldn't be caught again. And um, to play this game, there's you're sort of moving cubes around on a map, trying to get them to safety. Um, there's dice to roll. There's cards that come out that represent different um, historical events, historical characters, or resources that you can use in order to uh, advance this cause, as well as, well as historical threats and complications. Um, you play characters that were real characters in history, then they have some sort of special deal to them of what they can do to help the cause. Um, and then there's also kind of periods of history that are broken up in different ways. It starts, you know, different sections of history that are going to have different kinds of events, different kinds of complications, different kinds of advantages and disadvantages. Um, so as you play through this game, you, if it's working, you'll feel immersed in the strategy of freeing slaves from the south and getting them to Canada, um, as well as with all of the kind of the hardships and the, the, the hard moral choices uh, that people would have had to make in these kinds of situations, right? Um, so a theme like this, I don't think it's too hard to, to argue here that a theme like this has a lot more cloud work going on. It's going to generate a lot more sort of imagination and reflection about what's happening in the imaginary world that we're generating than a game like Yinch does, right? And even more than a game like Bonanza does. You're not really thinking about beans here, but you are really thinking about slavery here um, and freeing slaves here, right? You're thinking about that period of history in kind of a deep and complex way. You might even be learning some things about it. Okay. So having a theme is a big deal. In uh, if you want to have a narrative game, it's got to have some kind of a theme, and preferably we're going to shoot for kind of the richer, more immersive themes rather than the lighter paced on themes or the no themes at all, right? Okay. So once you have a theme and you have a theme that feels like it's good at telling a story, you want the mechanics to mesh with that theme really well. Um, you don't want that pasted on theme, and we're going to go over that again in a second, um, you want sort of really a good match between uh, theme and mechanics. So let's start with some mistakes there. Um, there are games where uh, mechanics are greater than theme, where the whole point of the game is not theme really at all, um, but to get mechanics done. And so an example of that would be um, Steffenfeld's Bruges, which is thematically about building the economic life and the uh, canal of the city Bruges, uh, but in any practical way is really about, well, it's making about, about making interesting choices. Um, I want to show you what the cards look like. I don't know if you can see this in the picture here above my head, um, but there's some cards out here. On the back of these cards is a building, and on the front of these cards is some faces. They kind of look like this. In this game, you'll get a hand of cards, and those cards will give you certain choices. Um, one of the choices is to pay some money, shown up in the corner here, and then play this character down in front of you. And now you have this friend or helper that gives you a certain benefit during the game. Another choice you have is to do one of these things on the side with the card. You can exchange this card for some purple worker people or you can exchange this card for however much money is shown on the purple die that was rolled at the beginning of the round, or you can exchange this card to get rid of a purple threat, which comes out occasionally, or you can use this card to build a canal in a purple space, or you can flip this over and build a purple house out of it. So this is really a really good um, mechanism for creating interesting choices. You have here a hand of cards that do yellow things and red things and blue things and brown things and purple things. 
Um, and you can use each of those cards in a number of different ways. So you have a pretty rich decision space just by drawing a few cards. Um, what you don't have is a very rich thematic space, right? Which is like, what is this card supposed to represent? Is it a person that can turn into a building or a canal? Or you can sell it for money? Like, what is this thing? The point is that um, while modern board gaming, some modern board games are very much about creating interesting decision spaces, they don't necessarily care um, if the theme is consistently uh, understood throughout those decision spaces or in different areas of the game. It's, it's okay in this design that um, this resource just represents choices uh, and not anything thematic, right? Um, because the, the, the design philosophy here is that the mechanics are more important than the theme, right? The theme's there and it's good, uh, but what we're really here for is the mechanics and decisions. Let's go in for another example of a pasted on theme. I forget what I loaded here. Oh yeah, this is Lost Cities. Reiner Knizia's Lost Cities is a two-player card game uh, where the theme is, uh, at least superficially, about going on adventures of different kinds. Uh, but the way you do that is you can go on a red adventure by playing red numbered cards or a white adventure by playing white numbered cards, a blue adventure by playing blue numbered cards and so on. And your job is to play low numbers first and then higher numbers and you want to get a highest total that you possibly can, um, higher than the other player. And it's a great, it's a great two player card game, but it does not really feel much like you're going on any adventure. It feels like you're stacking colored cards of numbers together to try to get the best set. Um, and these, this art, which is great, could have been any number of other things and would have just worked just as fine. All right. So not much narrative coming out of that. A little bit, there's a little bit of imagination there with the pasted on theme. We can sort of think, ooh, look at this pretty art. And mm, maybe I'm going down to these temple. And that, that's interesting. Um, but there's no mechanics to sort of further support that imagination, right? So, at the, at the, so I would say that sort of mechanics greater than the theme or pasted on theme or at one end of a spectrum where you have like very, very little um, narrative engagement or rules to support the imaginary world. And on the other end of that spectrum, at a, like a different kind of weird extreme, you have simulationism where the game is... Um, meant to be as faithful as possible to the real world in its sort of mathematical modeling of different situations. Uh, there's a lot of war games like this that care not so much about sort of uh, cleanness in design or simplicity of rule sets as they care about faithfulness to historical circumstances. So um, this is Advanced Squad Leader, which is squad level tactical combat simulator. Um, I want you just to look at the size of this binder of rules right here. And then I want you to look over here at this folder and that rule book, and then at all these tables and charts and things and reference that they need in order to play this game full of these little chits that come, come out on the board. It's a heavy game. Um, and it's heavy primarily because um, every possible historical weapon uh, and vehicle has its own stats that make it different in the game from the other ones and you need to know what that is um, so you can flip through your book and reference oh yes the tank does this and this and that um, if you throw a grenade down a hallway it's going to be a different effect than throwing a grenade uh, out into an open space uh, I haven't played this game I don't want to learn this whole rule book but from what I have seen and learned about it it's it's probably a really, really great simulation of tactical combat uh, if you're sort of willing to wade through all this to get at how it works. Um, but I think there's a pretty rich strategy there. But the design philosophy here is that sort of faithfulness to historic circumstances is more important than ease of play, right? It may be even more important than giving the player a grip on inter interesting decisions, right? Because in order to figure out which decisions you can even make here, it's kind of a lot to know. Okay, so that's at the other end of the spectrum is simulationism, which is not necessary to produce narrative, although, right, this is going to produce a more faithful and rich narrative ex imaginary experience than any of the games we've looked at so far other than Underground Railroad, right? Um, the imaginary, the, the, the cloud space, where did that go? 
in advanced squad leader there's a lot of this going on there's a lot of like um, oh we're doing this so now we need to look up the rule for how that works right but there is a rule for any kind of weird thing that we can imagine <laughs> to do in this situation all right simulationism so somewhere in the middle of that is what I call verisimilitude um, this is a word that fiction writers use to say um, fiction isn't ever real right but it's in realistic fiction, your job is to try to make the language real enough so that your readers buy into it. They say, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's how that works. That's real enough. And even if you're writing science fiction or fantasy or something, verisimilitude would be, um, it's real, it feels real enough to the reader that they'll go along with you. They'll suspend whatever you know, disbeliefs that might be triggered by fantastic elements or sci-fi elements because you've painted them in such a way that it feels human and feels dramatically real, right? You throw a dragon at a character um, because it's consistent with the world you've created, they still buy in, right? So when board games do this, they're kind of not simulationism exactly. They're not trying to get every single realistic rule, but they're also not pasted on theme. What did I put for example? Oh, yeah, so this is Captain Sonar. This is another war game, but war, real war gamers wouldn't take this as a war game because uh, it in no way is attempting to recreate anything historic or recreate any reality of what it's like to be a submarine crew. But it is sort of feels like a light and fun and engaging version of what being a submarine crew might be like. Um, it's maybe a little bit hard to see, but in between this rows of players, there's this uh, sort of um, screen so that the players can't, each team can't see what the other one is doing. And each side of the screen is a team of players that is the crew of an imaginary submarine. And so each player has a different play sheet that represents a different station of their submarine. There's like a captain and an engineer and a radar operator and uh, something else that I'm forgetting. Uh, and as they're playing, the whole team has to work together in order to find and destroy the other submarine before they do the same to them. Um, one piece of this that I think is really quite good, I think here's a picture of it, is the radar operator is tracking the movement of the other sub and trying to figure out where they are. So both teams play on a shared map. Uh, and when the opposing sub-captain calls out their movement, they might say, one space south, uh, one space east. The radar operator is going to draw a line on this transparency and track their movements. But because this piece of transparency is mobile, they can sort of shift it around the map to see where this pattern of movements might fit and where it might not fit. So you can see the enemy sub has gone south, 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 west. If they go west one more time, we know that they can't be here because that's an island. So she can then shift maybe a little bit down here. Maybe they're down here or up here. She can shift this around the map uh, to guess at where their location might be. The longer the game goes on, the fewer places they can be on the map that would sort of fit that line. Uh, and then they'll know where they are. They're tracking them down. That's not how radar works. That is not sort of an appropriate math mod mathematical model for how different um, kinds of radar operation worked in submarines over time. So it doesn't have that sort of simulationist fidelity. Um, but it does kind of feel like you're tracking the hidden movements of an enemy that you can hear a little bit, little pings of their location, right? Um, and getting more and more specific over time. It also feels like in a submarine, I assume, is sort of a team of people trying to do something with a certain chain of command. Same thing is happening in this game too with the captain and everybody else. Um, so that to me that's what I mean by board game verisimilitude. It doesn't really feel like a real submarine um, but it it feels like the real theme of a submarine I guess. It kind of feels submarine-y for lack of a better word. Um, I guess I got another example of a good blend. Oh, Battlestar Galactica. So this is obviously not real in any way. 
This is, if you're not familiar with the intellectual property here, Battlestar Galactica is a TV show, sort of two versions of the TV show came out, um, about the last surviving humans uh, in a, the spaceship going through space, they're being chased by a brace of alien robots that are trying to destroy them all. Um, and in this version of Battlestar Galactica, at least, some of the humans are actually robots in disguise and are, have infiltrated and are trying to sabotage the humans' efforts. So in the board game Battlestar Galactica, you play the crew of this spaceship and you have to do sort of space battle-y stuff and work together to do it. But you're also each given hidden roll cards, and some of those hidden roll cards say you're a Cylon, you're an, you're an enemy robot, which means that your win conditions are different. You win when the human players lose. Uh, and so your job is to try to sabotage everything they're doing without being caught as a Cylon. So that simple little traitor mechanic, is what it's called, a traitor mechanism, creates a sort of spirit and tension among the players that mirrors the kind of spirit and tension that's among the characters on the TV show. Uh, because the characters on the TV show are in a high stress situation having to do life or death stuff, uh, but they also distrust each other and there's a lot of tension among them. Exactly the same thing happens among the players playing this game. Uh, there's high stakes missions to do, uh, but there's also a sense that you're not sure if you can trust the motives of anybody else at the table. Did they do that because they had to? Because they think they're helping? Or because they're an enemy robot that needs to be destroyed, right? Um, so this, between this and Captain Sonar, this is kind of like the level of narrative. Um, for me, it's kind of a sweet spot of narrative engagement. Uh, the theme is there, and the mechanics that are there are meant to push players deeper into that theme, right? Uh, the reason that there's a traitor mechanism in Battlestar Galactica is so that we can interact in ways that help us imagine like we're really in the show. We're really doing these things. Uh, the reason that the sonar operator rules work the way they do is so that the radar um, crewman can listen to the other opposing captain and imagine that they're actually tracking them down, right? Um, when theme and mechanisms are well blended, um, it produces that kind of the extra layer of engagement with the theme, extra layer of imagination, which I would call a narrative engagement. After the game of Captain Sonar or after Battlestar Galactica, the kind of player story um, that you might tell is very much overlapped with the thematic story. Oh man, I can't believe you were silent. That's why you did this and this and that, right? That's a player story, but it's it's also an in-game story because in the game, that character that they played was the Cylon and did those things. So there's this kind of mesh between the player story and the in-game story that gets generated um, emergently through play. All right, so, so far we've got you need to have a theme. You probably want to have a theme that's good at generating story. And then you want to have your mechanics be those that push players deeper into that theme. If you want to go all the way into simulationism and have a rule for every possible, you know, thing of reality, um, I personally think that's too far. I think you get more bogged down in rules than you do in engagement with the imagination until you sort of learn all the rules. Um, I think a sweeter spot is something like these other games where the rules aren't quite as deep or comprehensive or realistic, but they do make players feel like they're kind of having that kind of experience, right? Okay, so uh, I guess the last point for this video uh, is that there's a, a really pretty different, um, the difference between classic, or what I'll call classic board games and the way they do narrative and modern board games and the way that they do narrative is the difference between roll and move versus giving players choices. So uh, let me show you what I mean by roll and move. These are sort of two games that are meant to produce a feeling like you're living through someone's life. That's a whole life story, right? This is the classic game of life. You may remember this one where you spin the dial and then you get to move your little car along the track that many spaces, you land on the space and you do what it says. Um, occasionally there's choice. There's not a lot of choices in this game, but occasionally there are because the paths branch. Um, the first choice you get is go to work right away or um, go to college. 
And if you go this way, there's sort of a slower economic progress, but it pays off more later, you hope. Uh, if you go this way, it's sort of a faster payoff, um, but maybe not, um, maybe not as much over the course of the game. You can see down here, there's cards that you'll draw. There's sort of career and college career, and these cards generally pay off better than those do. Although, if we're being honest, these days, there should also be like huge debt cards that you draw too. Um, anyway, so there's a couple other branching parts of the, of the path in this game, but it's mostly linear. It's mostly like going around, spinning the dial, seeing how far you go, doing what it says on the thing, sometimes making some money, uh, maybe making more money if you write the, made the right choices, maybe not. Um, and then eventually ending up at the end of the game. Whoever has the most money and happiness or whatever is the winner. I think it's money. I think you want to be money in this game. But you also have like pink and blue pegs that you put in your car because maybe you get married to pink and blue people and have pink and blue babies in your car and fill that up and that's important too. Um, so that is kind of classic rule and move way of producing narrative. And by the, you know, frankly, by the end of this game, you have produced a story, right? You've produced the story of your character who went through life and did certain things. They went to college or they didn't. They got whatever kind of job. They bought some kind of house. Um, they had kids or maybe they didn't. Uh, they did whatever they did with their money. And then at the end of the game, they had what they had, right? They had, they had their life. They arrived. Um, and that does produce a story, but it's, it's very much the story that it produces is produced and it's produced by the game, right? Mostly at random. There's random card draws and random movements and random uh, events that all sort of, you know, shoot story at you as you go. Modern board games are about, instead of randomness, this is a generalization, um, but the sort of general design impulse is to move away from the game shooting random things at you and toward giving the player lots of interesting decisions and agency, right? So let me show you another game called The Pursuit of Happiness, which is also meant to model the life story of a middle-class individual that gets jobs and makes money and stuff. Uh, but it does that instead of by random movement, it does that entirely by player choice. There's a lot going on here, there's a lot of stuff. Um, let me see if I can give a brief explanation. The red player here has a series of pawns that look like hourglasses, and those hourglasses represent how they spend their time during different phases of their life. This is sort of the life phases this track where they're young and they get older and then go into old age. Uh, depending how healthy you are, you can go further, I think, is how that works. Uh, so you place these pawns on the board over here, and each of these spaces allows you to do different kinds of stuff. Like you can study, or you can play, or you can interact with friends. Um, you can have some kind of project, or spend your money, or get a temporary job. You can get a real job. You can develop a relationship, a romantic relationship. Or you can work overtime, and you can rest. Those are kind of the choices that you have of how you spend your limited amount of time at each phase. Um, and those Choices will give you different kinds of resources. The in-game resources are social sort of friendship points, uh, social currency, uh, creativity, uh, knowledge, and money. And then you'll spend those resources on these cards over here, uh, which are like jobs and stuff you can buy. And uh, I think it's hobbies. I think this one's hobbies. And then relationships. So you might decide like, I want to get in a relationship with this dude. Uh, but in order to do that, I need certain kinds of resources, and so I'll spend those and then gain whatever resources that relationship gives me, right? And I'll put them down over here in my, my pile, and maybe I'll, you know, develop that romantic relationship to advance through this track and get more stuff and more points, right? There's all the points, which is this track around the outside. Um, and the game just kind of goes like that through the different phases of your life. You're taking different actions. You're getting different jobs and making advances in those jobs, maybe changing careers midlife. Um, you're spending money on vacations or collections of stuff. Um, you are uh, developing different hobbies, stuff to do in your spare time. And you're developing different romantic relationships which may pan out over the course of your life or you may change over and find somebody else. Um, there's also a currency for stress and happiness here which have different in-game effects. Um, by the end of the game, you've got sort of a collection of cards down here of things you've done and people you've been in love with and 
uh, jobs that you've had and stuff that you've bought. And it sort of all adds up to some kind of number of points. Uh, person with the most points wins. And at the end of it, you have like a narrative experience too, which is just like the game of life. I've lived this life. I've done these things. I've had these jobs. I've had these relationships. Um, but I would argue that the engagement with that theme here is richer and more engaging because the story that came out is personalized to you through your own choices, right? Instead of the game telling you, oh, good, you went to college, you have this random job. You're a doctor or you're a lawyer or whatever. Um, it's, hmm, I have a choice of these kinds of jobs to get. I think I'll be a video game designer or I think I'll be an artist or I think I'll be a plumber or I think I'll be a, and I'll invest some time and energy in that in order to be a really good one, right? Or maybe I won't, maybe I'll just use it for a while and then move on to something else. Um, there's a lot more flexibility in this decision space than there is in life, which is a more advanced game. Um, but because the mechanics here are about giving lots of agency to the player, um, they're also inviting that player to invest and engage more deeply in the theme, which is, you know, have the life you want to have in this situation. Have the job you want to have. Date the person you want to date. Um, cultivate the kind of currency that you want to and spend it the way you want. Do you want to mostly focus on having cool relationships or cool creative ideas? Well, there's cards that will allow you to do that and sort of maximize a certain life strategy, right? Um, okay, so anyway, let me sum up here. I think it's about time to wrap this video up. We've been through a lot of stuff. Uh, but in summary, if you're going to design a board game that tells a story, you want it to have a theme. Games without themes or games with very light themes don't do a lot of narrative engagement. They don't put people into that cloud of fictional imagining. Um, so you want to have a theme and make it a good one. Make it a, meaning By that I mean uh, make it one that sort of lends itself well to uh, narrative. It has a kind of pre-known arc or is in some way has a story stuff to it, right? Um, and then you want to pick mechanisms that blend well. Oh, I don't have that link. Oh, no, I'll add a link. That's what that means. Uh, you want to pick mechanisms that blend well with the theme that you've chosen. Um, this thing that says link says, I'm going to put a link in the show notes here to a couple of videos by the Dice Tower Network um, that are called like uh, Terms of Modern Board Games or something like that. There are a couple of videos that explain um, some of the language of modern board gaming, but in the process they go through like a bullet point list of a bunch of different modern uh, game design mechanisms that you might not have heard of if you haven't been playing contemporary board games. Um, there's a bunch of different uh, <clears throat> styles and mechanisms out there and uh, there's no... It's important to be familiar with that if you're going to design a board game even if you're just going to design a board game, but if you want to design a narrative one, you want to be aware of the different options you have and aware of the different kind of um, emotional engagement that those different mechanics create so that when you pick a theme, you can pick mechanics that match with it really well, right? Um, so I'll, I'll put those links and if you watch those, you'll get a pretty good sense of different kinds of mechanisms that are out there. Uh, and, oh, one more thing, you can also if you go to Board Game Geek and you hover over Browse and you click on Mechanics, uh, you will also see a list of all kinds of different mechan oh, man, come on. all kinds of different mechanisms. Let me go backwards. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, if you thought maybe a betting game would be a good one for whatever theme that you're working on, uh, you could scroll down to this list and then I would say Sort by Rank. Uh, or number of ratings, depending. And then sort of look at some of the games on this list that have betting in them uh, and see how they use that uh, mechanism to, to bring out their theme or not, right? Um, so you can kind of study the ways that this mechanism has been used if you want to go pretty deep uh, and see all the different ways that it gets used and then think about, well, how would I use it to represent the theme that I'm, that I'm working on, right? Uh, okay, so you're going to have a theme, make it a good one for narrative, you're going to pick mechanics that match well with it. In order to do that, you're going to do some studying to figure out what mechanics are out there. Um, and then you're going to present players with choices that immerse them in that theme. Your chosen mechanics, because they match well, 
should put players in a position where they feel like they're making the kinds of choices that people in that situation would make. Um, it may not be super realistic, but it may be, it feels right. It has a kind of good match to it. It has the same kind of emotional tension or interest that um, that theme would have. Like Captain Sonar, not a real submarine, but kind of feels submarine-like, right? And they're making choices and taking actions that kind of feel like, feel like that, okay? So have a theme, make it good, uh, develop it with good mechanics, and give the players choices that make them feel like they're in the action. And the result of that should be that they are generating a good amount of this. Maybe not a perfect amount of that, maybe not a really deep and rich story, but a bunch of imaginary engagement with the theme of the game, right? That's sort of the foundation for how board games tell stories. In the next episode, we will talk about some specific mechanics that are um, heavily narrative, that sort of push narrative even harder. Um, but the, the foundation here is theme and mechanics and the engagement between the two uh, for creating imaginary spaces. All right, that is it. I've talked too long. Um, I'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.